On today's episode, part two of my Blackhawks top prospect rankings and Michael Hage's NHL draft profile. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Blackhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Do me a quick favor if you're watching on YouTube right now, smash that like button for me. Comment down below as well as to your thoughts on forward prospect Michael Hage and whether you think he should be on the Blackhawks radar at number 18 in this year's draft. Make sure you're subscribed to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube as well. Won't cost you anything. 100% free and really does go a long way for yours truly last but certainly not least got to let you all know today's episode is sponsored by game time make sure to go and download the game time app right now and when you do create an account and use the promo code lockdown nhl in all caps for 20 dollars off to sporting events concerts or theater events near you All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. To open things up on the show here today, it's part two of my Chicago Blackhawks Summer 2024 Top Prospect Ranking. And for those who didn't catch part one, which dropped yesterday, make sure to go and check that out as well as I dove into numbers 16 through 20. And yes, I am going into a top 20 rankings this year with the Blackhawks prospect pool, even though Connor Bedard and Kevin Korchinski have graduated, it's still rather deep and there's still a slew of names that I think are worth mentioning and worth shouting out. So I decided to extend it from a top 10 list to a top 20. So again, make sure to go and part catch up on part one uh, to get all caught up before we get into numbers 11 through 15 on today's episode. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into it, Blackhawks fans. Coming in at number 15 on my Blackhawks summer 2024 top prospects ranking is none other than Landon Slagger, six foot, 185 pound winger who turned 22 a few weeks ago and was a third round selection by the Blackhawks, 79th overall, two picks ahead of defenseman Wyatt Kaiser back in the 2020 NHL draft. And he wrapped up a big time senior season as the captain of the Notre Dame fighting Irish tallying 20 goals and 11 assists for 31 points in 36 games during his senior campaign. Really neat out of Landon Slaggard as well, considering he had a very disappointing junior year in which he only tallied 13 points, seven goals and six assists in 30 games. So great to see him get up to that point per game margin and really have a boost in the goal scoring department in his final year of college hockey. And that led to him after Notre Dame season came to a close signing his ELC with the Chicago Blackhawks and making his NHL debut wound up playing in 16 games with the team at the end of the season, tallying four points scoring his first NHL goal. Finally, after numerous close calls and overturned goal slags, finally got one to count and also chipped in for three assists en route to those four points in 16 games. And it's going to be a very big summer in fall for him as he tries to make the Blackhawks opening night roster out of training camp. Although I see that being a little bit of a long shot, he's going to have to have a good camp in order to crack the team. More than likely Rockford bound though, which isn't the worst thing in the world whatsoever as the organized organization continues to preach patience and is not in a rush whatsoever to be developing these prospects. But as far as what Landon Slagger brings to the table, he's got some good speed. He's got good compete level. He's a little bit of a bottom six uh, power forward type of build, a guy who will uh, make his presence felt all over the ice. He's a good four checker, works hard along the boards, tries to strip the puck and get it back for his team. Kind of has capped offensive upside, I think, at the NHL level, but a very intense, uh, high energy player that I think can chip in from time to time on the offensive front, but does probably have a bottom six ceiling. And that's why he comes in at number 15. At number 14 here, we have Paul Ludwinski, someone who I think is 
very similar to Landon Slager. Five foot 11, 190 pound winger. He has played the center as well in his junior career, the center position, I should say, but a couple years younger than Landon Slager as he just turned 20 a couple of months ago in April and was a second round pick, 39th overall by the Blackhawks in 2022. And looking back at things, 39 might have been a little bit too high for Paul Ludwinski to go because I don't think he does have the highest offensive upside, but I think he's going to be a very versatile and unique prospect in the Blackhawks uh, pipelines right now because while he did uh, make a nice uptick in the offensive category this season after having only 34 points in 47 games the year prior, only nine of those uh, were goals. He had 23 goals and 46 assists for 69 points in 60 OHL games in his second year as the captain of the Kingston Frontenacs and then joined on with the Rockford Ice Hogs to play in his first five pro games late in the year. But uh, as I said, he, he's someone who, like Landon Slaggard, has a really high motor. I think he's a better skater for sure than Landon Slaggard is and might have a little bit more offense in his arsenal. But uh, someone who kind of likes to play a rugged style style of game is a good defensive player as well makes an effort on that side of the puck so I think he's going to be a very well-rounded player but probably a third liner at best but I do have him ranked a little bit higher than Landon Slager because I like his offensive upside better I like his skating ability better I just think he has a higher ceiling comparatively with one another next up at number 13 we have Adam Guyan six foot two 190 pound goaltender who just turned 20 years of age uh, a month ago in early May, and of course was the first goaltender off the board in last year's draft, went 35th overall in the second round to the Blackhawks, uh, and kind of had a little bit of a disappointing season, if I'm being honest, with the Green Bay Gamblers. He had a good record. He was 23-12-6, and six, but had a 3.35 goals against average, an 893 save percentage, and no shutouts in 43 USHL starts this year. And just compared to what we saw from him, at the World Juniors where he really burst onto the scene and that's what led to him being the first goalie off the board. It just wasn't the development necessarily that I wanted to see out of Adam Guyan. And also when you think about the years that, you know, Michael Harabel had, Jacob Fowler, Trey Augustine, it does sting a little bit that the Hawks took Guyan first off of the board uh, ahead of all of those guys. But as I said, he's still only 20 years old, very young, probably, you know, three or four years away from even hitting the pro scene four or five six years away from reaching the NHL level. So it's always a long process with goaltenders. We don't know exactly who of that group is going to be the best goaltender moving forward. It wasn't the most encouraging year for Adam Guyan. That's why I have him dropping down the rankings a little bit. I have him below Drew Comesso now, but still, of course, higher than uh, Jackson Stauber. I still think he could be an NHL caliber goaltender, but he's going to have to have a big year in the fall uh, as a freshman where he'll be joining Minnesota Duluth in college hockey. Next Next up at number 12, Nick Lardis, 5'11", 170-pound offensive winger. Not a lot of size, but boy, can he light it up in a very young prospect. Still 18 years old, not going to turn 19 until next month in July, and was a third-round pick for the Hawks in 2023. Slid all the way to 67th overall, and this is a kid that some folks thought could have been a late first-round pick, you know, going early to middle second round. He fell all the way till early in the third for the Black. Hawks, one of my favorite value picks, my favorite value pick outside of Oliver Moore, Connor Bedard, obviously that's a different conversation. I love this pick by the Blackhawks. Unfortunately, Lardis was a little banged up this past year with the Brantford Bulldogs, but in the 37 OHL games that he played, he picked up right where he left off late last year when he got traded to them, tallying 29 goals and 21 assists in those 37 games. He is a bona fide goal scorer, Blackhawks fans, a little bit uh, kind of like Alex. Alex DeBrinket, undersized, but has an unbelievable shot, knows how to find those open spots to score goals and plays uh, with some good speed. I think he plays a translatable game to the NHL level. The question is his abilities when he doesn't have the puck. There's a lack of size. He's not the best defensive prospect. He's not going to be a penalty killer. So he's really going to have to be a goal scorer at the NHL level to make his impact felt. That is a little bit of a concern, but he's had a very good junior hockey career since the Blackhawks selected him and I thought he's looked more than capable uh, getting time in the preseason with the Blackhawks as well. So I'm super excited about Nick Lardis. It's just going to be how he develops offensively at the NHL level is going to be the determining factor 
of how big of an impact he makes or whether he's even going to be an NHL or there are some questions, but I think his offensive game is going to translate. I don't have him in the top 10, but I have him ahead of guys like Guyane, uh, Ludwinski and, and Slagger for sure, because his upside is undoubtedly higher than those guys. And if he hits, if he develops into an NHL player, uh, he could be a very good one. And number 12 kind of could look like a disservice in a couple of years if Nick Lardis pans out to his full potential. So I have him coming in at number 12. I think he uh, could be probably not a top line guy, but I think he could be a middle six goal scorer or if, again, he pans out properly these next couple of years. And then last but certainly not least, to wrap up part two here today, coming in at number 11, just outside of my top 10, is Gavin Hayes, six foot two, 180-pound winger who turned 20 years old back in May, third-round pick for the Blackhawks in the 2022 NHL Draft, 66 overall, and kind of comparatively to Paul Ludwinski, you know, I mentioned Paul Lee Ludz went 39th, Gavin Hayes went 66. Gavin Hayes, to me, I think is the more intriguing prospect at this point in time because of his offensive abilities that have been on Full display the last two years, he tallied 81 points, 41 goals, and 40 assists in 66 games with the Flint Firebirds last year, uh, combined for the Sioux Greyhounds in the Firebirds. This season, he had uh, 76 points, 37 goals, and 39 assists in only 55 games, so the goal scoring was great. The playmaking was on display once again. Also was part of the um, gold medal winning United States roster at the World Juniors in the winter. And what I honestly kind of liked is that he didn't play a top six role there. He was a penalty killer, a fourth liner. Uh, He's got some good size. And if he can continue to round out his game in other ways, I think it could be a very unique and Swiss army knife, like a little bit uh, middle six winger for the Chicago Blackhawks one day down the road with a good shot, with good goal scoring, with good speed and some decent size to go along with it. He's going to have to throw on some weight, I think, to hit his true potential. But I'm very excited about Gavin Hayes, especially as the 66th overall pick a couple of years ago. I do think he could be an NHL player for the Blackhawks and a darn good one as well. Excited to see if he's going to be making the leap to the Rockford Ice Hogs and playing pro hockey full-time next year. I think that's probably uh, the next step after a very successful last couple of years in the OHL. All right, that is going to wrap up part two of my Chicago Blackhawks summer 2024 top 20 prospect rankings. Go and jump in the comment section down below right now to let me know your thoughts on my rankings thus far. If you agree, disagree, think someone's too high, too low, make sure to go let me know down below in the comment section. But don't go anywhere because coming up in just a moment, I'll get into 18-year-old forward Michael Hage's 2024 NHL draft profile. But first, I got to talk to you all real quick about game time. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to the next ball game that you want to attend. And I'm here happy to announce that game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets both faster and easier. Plus, prices on the game time app actually go down the closer that it gets to the first pitch. And with killer last minute deals, all in prices and their lowest price guarantee, game time helps take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And I personally love game time. I've said it time and time again on the show. I've used it since I was back in high school. This is the God's honest truth. I've always used game time when trying to get tickets to Hawks games with my buddies or when I'm trying to go to Wrigley in the summer and catch a Cubs game, or even if I'm traveling in another city and want to go see a concert or a comedy event, I always check game time first because it's the fastest, cheapest, and easiest way for you to purchase your tickets. Plus, they got last minute tickets, flash deals, and zone deals that make it so easy to find and buy MLB tickets. Now that baseball season is about to take over. So make sure to go and download the game time app right now. And when you do create an account and use the promo code, Locked on NHL in all caps to get $20 off with your first purchase. Yes, you heard me right. You can get $20 off to go and see Seiya Suzuki, Shota Imanaga, and the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field this summer. All you got to do, download game time, create an account, and use the promo code Locked on NHL in all caps. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed game time. 
Segment two, it's time to get into my next 2024 NHL draft profile here on the show. We're less than three weeks removed from day one of the 2024 NHL draft. I'm starting to uh, really feel it in my stomach, Blackhawks fans. Very excited to see who the Hawks are going to take at number two. And as I talked about on the show a couple of days ago, it sounds like the Blackhawks are still very much so debating between Artem Levshinov and Ivan Demidov with the second overall pick. Make sure to go and check out that episode for my full thoughts on the matter. You can easily find it on my YouTube channel. And if there's any other prospect that you want to hear about at this point in time, I've covered most of the notable ones, Demidov, Levshinov. Zeev Buyam, Zane Parekh, Salayev, Sam Dickinson, so on and so forth, Cole Eiserman. If there's anyone in the group in particular that you want to hear my full thoughts about, you can easily find those episodes on the YouTube channel under the 2024 NHL Draft Profile Playlist. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of the rest of the profiles and the rest of my Blackhawks. Summer 2024 top prospect rankings that are going to be released here over the next couple of weeks. But the next draft profile that I got to get into here today is none other than Michael Hage, six foot one, 190 pound center who turned 18 back in April. A, and he tallied 75 points, 33 goals and 42 assists in 54 USHL games with the Chicago Steel this past season. And obviously the Blackhawks have that relationship with the organization. So I'm sure they're very familiar with Michael Hage and have gotten a lot of uh, looks at him over the last couple of years. He was also part of the Chicago Steel team last year, but only got to play in 13 games as he suffered a torn labrum in September that forced him to miss the majority of the season. But a really, really strong year from Michael Hage, particularly in the second half. He got off to a little bit of a slow start, as did the Chicago Steel as a team in the USHL. Uh, but there was a lot that Michael Hage was having to deal with. Unfortunately, uh, he tragically lost his father in a swimming accident last summer. So I'm sure it must have been very difficult for him at a you know very crucial time for his future in his draft year to start it off having to deal with that. I'm sure there were a lot of things on his mind. I'm sure it wasn't easy to go out there and compete and family absolutely comes first. So I, I completely understand Michael Hage not getting off to the best start, but he really was a very effective player later on in the season. I believe he had over 50 points in the final 32 games of the year for the Chicago Steel and wound up with the uh, fourth highest points per game in the entire USHL. So someone whose stock has also been kind of rising over the last four to five months based on his play late in the season. And he also is going to be attending the University of Michigan in the fall, one of the most prestigious college hockey programs in the entire country. You know he's going to get some good development work over the next couple of years there. Could make him a very intriguing prospect for a lot of teams in the mid to late first round, including, of course, our Chicago Blackhawks, who have the 18th overall pick. But as far as the rankings here for Michael Hage, kind of all over the place a little bit, uh, ranked 24th by elite prospects, 36th by Bob McKenzie. He's the only one of the group here that projects, projects him to go out of the first round, 21st by Craig Button, 29th by Tony Ferrari. So again, a late first round pick there. His highest 12th though, rated by McKean's Hockey, 23rd by Chris Peters, 19th by Daily Faceoff, 20th by Sportsnet, and 26th by Dauber Prospects. So a couple think, you know, he could fall into the final few picks of the first round. And Bob McKenzie thinks he's going to be a high second round pick. Most of the uh, scouts and analysts here, though, have him going somewhere between, you know, numbers 19 and 26 or 27. But breaking down the skills for Michael Hage, he's just got a pretty good all-in-all -all offensive makeup, good skating ability. Nothing really elite, though, is kind of the problem. And I think that's becoming more clear as I'm kind of getting into this next tier of prospects, right? I've already covered most of the players expected to go in the top 15 and top 16. And as I've mentioned on this show, there is kind of a known consensus out there that it, it's kind of split right in the middle of the first round in terms of the high tier prospects. And then the second tier a little bit after it kind of splits after number 15 or number 16, right in the middle there. And I think it's pretty clear when you're looking at a prospect like Michael Hage, there's a lot to like, but there just aren't necessarily any elite traits, but he has a very well-rounded game. Like I said, starting with the skating ability, um, 
really good edge work is able to turn in a hurry and to create that space for himself. I also think he pairs that with really solid puck handling. That might be his best offensive attribute, honestly, is uh, how he is as a center able to kind of utilize that speed of his and dish uh, dazzle through some players in order to make them miss and enter the offensive zone with some speed. I think he is a decent uh, has a decently translatable ability to carry pucks into the offensive zone at the next level. He has a good shot too, a good uh, curl and drag release that I honestly like more than Beckett Seneca's, who I broke down on yesterday's episode. Go and check that show out if you want to hear more about Beckett. As uh, some folks think he could even creep into the top 10 of this year's draft. I like Michael Hage's shot better than Beckett Seneca's. Um, maybe not the full arsenal of offensive makeup, but he's a good passer as well. Reads defenses pretty skillfully, um, attacks the middle of the ice, which I really like. He recognizes a smart player recognizes that the middle of the ice is the most dangerous spots, uh, and, and he'll drive the center of the ice himself. Despite not, despite not having the largest frame at only six foot one, one hundred ninety pounds. I think if he gains some weight, he could be a little bit of a power forward type build. I know he doesn't have the biggest size, but he willingly drives the net. Again, recognizing that that's the most dangerous part of the ice. And when he does have the puck, he draws defenders to them in order to allow his teammates to open up in the middle of the ice to give them prime scoring opportunity. So his recognition of plays is pretty solid. He's got good speed. He's got good shot. Uh, he's a good passer, probably going to be more of a passer than a goal scorer at the next level, but an above average shot as well. Uh, and, and someone who has a pretty decent compete level in terms of willing to go to the dirty areas. There's a lot to like about Michael Hage's game. Uh, in terms of the weaknesses, there is some lackluster defensive consistency that may cause some concern about his ability to play center at the next level, especially when he is a bit undersized, listed at only 190 pounds right now. Absolutely going to need to get stronger and round out his frame to hit that full potential. He also doesn't possess that like top level speed, that burst, that kind of separating speed. He doesn't necessarily possess that. There is some runway there. He's going to be going to Michigan. You know, those are things that are, that he's going to work on, but he doesn't have that game changing speed. Like a lot of forward prospects that I've covered so far do possess. Uh, and it's also just kind of hard to dictate exactly what his upside is going to be when I don't think he has any elite skill sets. He's got a lot of good attributes, but none of them are elite. So as far as my projection for me, yeah, it's just tough to call Michael Hage a top line type of guy when you're just not exactly sure what his upside is going to be. I think he could be a, a good player at the NHL level. Just hard to project that he's going to be great. But again, these are things that you could kind of expect when we're getting into that second tier of, of prospects that are projected to go in the first round of this year's draft. I think he, you know, shapes up to be a good middle six forward. I don't know if he's necessarily going to be a center, but again, just doesn't possess any elite skill set. So I envision him going somewhere between number 17 and number 25 in this year's draft. Um, but there is a lot to like about his game with a, a lot of good attributes. If he can develop those a little bit further at Michigan these next couple of years, yeah, I could I could see him being a second or third liner at the NHL level that can contribute offensively on a good basis. As far as a long-term fit for the Blackhawks, maybe uh, – I know there are a lot of people out there who love Michael Hage, and I feel like the Blackhawks are going to have a good read on him because the Chicago Steel are obviously local. They have that relationship with the organization. They've gotten a lot of looks at him. Personally, I don't love Michael Hage as much as some other people do. I wouldn't be upset with the pick. I think the Blackhawks absolutely could do worse at number 18. I just don't know if he exactly fits the makeup that they're looking for. I think – you know, the offensive upside is there, but at the center position, he doesn't have the greatest size. It feels like if they are going to take a center, it's going to be someone who's a little bit bigger personally. I just feel like they know that they need someone with a little bit more size in their system. And Michael Hage doesn't exactly play that type of game. So I don't know if he's going to be the highest player on their radar at number 18, but it's all going to 
you know, come down to who gets selected ahead of them and who's going to be available when they're on the clock at number 18. If they took Michael Hage, I wouldn't be upset about it. That would honestly tell me that they're confident in his abilities because I'm sure they've gotten so many looks at him. Um, I just feel like someone with a bigger frame is more likely if the Blackhawks are in fact going to go forward at number 18. But go and jump in the comment section down below. Let me know your thoughts on Michael Hage. Would you like to see him go 18th to the Chicago Blackhawks? And what do you think his upside is at the next level? Honestly, I, I had a little bit of a tough time diving through him exactly. And maybe it's because I, I did Beckett Seneca Um the episode before, and it feels like he's kind of a better version of Michael Hage. So that might have, you know, trickled some water on Michael Hage's profile a little bit. And maybe I'm not doing him enough due diligence. Maybe he is um, more capable than I'm giving credit for and could be a wowing selection at number 18 for the Blackhawks. I honestly do need to dive into some of these later first round picks a little bit more to kind of get my full thoughts on that. But please go and share your thoughts on Michael Hage and his makeup in this year's draft down in the comment section down below. But that's going to wrap up Michael Hage's 2024 NHL draft profile coming up in just a moment here, Blackhawks fans. Before I wrap things up, I still have to discuss the top free agent goaltenders that'll hit the market and whether the Blackhawks could pursue any of them in free agency. But first, I need to talk to you all about Policy Genius. A lot in life is unpredictable, but a good life insurance plan gives your family a financial safety net to protect against some of life's biggest unknowns. And Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace and makes choosing the right policy for your family both quick and easy. Because with Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at $292 per year for $1 million worth of coverage. And some options even are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius is also the country's leading online insurance marketplace that helps you save time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting right here today. Go and talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the entire process step-by-step -step along your side, comparing quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to get you the best and lowest price. So go and check life insurance off of your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com or you can simply go and click the link in the description down below to get your free life insurance quotes today and to see how much that you could be saving. Again, that's policygenius.com. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Again, a reminder out there to everyone, please go and support the show by hitting the like button, commenting down below, and subscribing to the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Won't cost you anything and really does help me out tremendously. And also, make sure to go and check out the new Lockdown Sports today because Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown, plus our national shows covering every single league. So make sure to go and check out Lockdown Sports Today on YouTube and to subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, segment three, not only... Uh, do we have the NHL draft approaching soon, Blackhawks fans? But free agency will follow, of course, just a couple of days later. And while I've talked about how I believe the Blackhawks aren't going to dish out a big ticket this summer to someone like Jake Gensel, Sam Reinhardt, or Steven Stamkos, we know they're not going to be bringing back Patrick Kane. I do believe they're going to be adding multiple players uh, on the free agent market this summer. And with that being the case, and with that being just a couple of weeks away, which is crazy to think that we're already less than a month away from free agency in the 4th of July, man, halfway through 2024. Crazy how time flies. But anyways, with that being the case, with that being the Blackhawk situation, even though they're not going to be dishing out big money, I really don't think. I do be believe they're going to be active in the free agent market. And with that being the case, over these next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about all of the free agents out there on the market. I'm going to be breaking each of them down position by position and talking about which ones I think we could see the Blackhawks pursue on July 1st. And starting today, uh, going to be getting into the free agent goal 
goaltenders. And while the Blackhawks gave an extension to Peter Morazic, we know he's coming back. Arvin Soderbloom still has one year left on his current deal. Drew Camesso still in the pipelines, more than likely going to be in Rockford again next year. Jackson Stauber is the real interesting one as a pending RFA. Had a really good year with the Rockford Icehogs. Will the Blackhawks bring him back? That's part of this debate. And this puts the Blackhawks in a really curious spot in terms of their goaltending for next season. They're still really good long-term, right? Drew Camesso, uh, Adam Guyan, potentially Jackson Stauber in the mix as well. They got a pretty good goaltending prospect pool, but they're in a little bit of a precarious position for next season. And the reason reasons for that is first, Arvid Soderbloom sucked eggs this year. He wasn't consistent whatsoever and was very disappointing in his first year as a full-time NHLer. And the second part of that is that the Blackhawks finally want to start getting better. They want to start winning more games next year, and they're going to need better goaltending, going to need better goaltending out of their backup in order for that to be the case. I don't think Luke Richardson wants to rely on Peter Morazic as much as he did last year, especially with his injury history. Yeah, Morazic is capable of doing what he did last year, but you know, you don't want to have to bank on that. And because of that situation, I do think one option for the Blackhawks is they could bring back Jackson Stauber and potentially have him compete with Arvid Soderbloom in training camp for that backup spot. However, Jackson Stauber is still an unknown at the NHL level. Like, yes, he did have a good two thirds of the season, second thirds, second third, <laughs> what second half of the season. I'm just going to say to make it easier on myself with Rockford last year was really spectacular to lead them into the Calder cup playoffs. There's no guarantee that he's going to be a good NHLer, And that's why I have him at number 19 spoiler alert on my Blackhawks summer 2024 top prospect rankings behind both Drew Camesso and Adam Guyan naturally. And because of that, I do think the Blackhawks could possibly kick the tires on a couple of goaltenders in free agency on July 1st. I also think a maybe more likely option is they don't sign someone in free agency. They maybe wait until training camp, see if another organization tries to sneak a veteran goaltender through waivers or something, and then the Blackhawks go and claim them because I do think there could be a need for a good and reliable, most the biggest thing, a reliable backup option behind Peter Morazic because if he goes down and the Blackhawks don't sign a free agent goaltender, they're going to be left with Arvid Soderbloom and Jackson Stauber. And it's going to be hard for them to achieve their goals of winning more games and getting better next season when that is the case. So I do think it's uh, fitting and only right to look at some of the free agent options that the Blackhawks could be looking at. And when diving into these options, I think it is important, though, to note that I don't expect the Blackhawks to dish out any term here because, as I said, you know, they don't want to be clogging up the pipelines. They don't want to be, you know, leaving Drew Camesso in Rockford for too long. Yeah, I do expect him to be in Rockford next year, but they're going to want a natural progression for him, and he'll probably be the backup for the Blackhawks during the 2025-2026 season, if I had to guess. So I really think they're looking, if they are looking at a free agent goaltender, it's a veteran uh, with a one-year deal with a low-cost AAV, someone who could just be a filler for this season in particular behind Peter Morazic until we get Drew Camesso a little bit more developed. Maybe we know a little bit more about Jackson Stauber uh, and we have a better understanding of exactly what Arvid Soderbloom is going to be, although we kind of have an idea of that already at this point in time. So breaking down some of these big-name free agent goaltenders, high-key, low-key, not a very good free agent goaltender class. Uh, Laurent Brassois, Anthony Stolarz, Cam Talbot, Ilya Samsonov, David Riddich. I think those guys are going to be the most sought-after goaltenders, and I don't think the Blackhawks are going to go after any of them. I would expect most of them would like at least a two-year deal, uh, and guys like, you know, Bressois, Stolars could be even looking at bigger roles, and I don't think they're going to be getting that in Chicago with Peter Morazic coming off of the type of season that he did. So while Bressois is a really good option, I like Stolars as well. He's still only 30 years old, put up really good numbers as a backup with the Panthers this year. Uh, David Riddich had a really good season with the Kings and has some ha has had some really good years um, recently. I just don't know if they necessarily fit what the Blackhawks are wanting to add, and I don't think they'd want to be coming here on a one-year deal to not play winning hockey and be a backup behind Peter Morazic. So quite honestly, I don't think those are very likely options for the Blackhawks. Kevin Lankinen is someone I figured I should shout out who's had a a very good last two years with Nashville since departing the Blackhawks organization as UC Saros is backup projected to have an AAV around $2 million, but on a two-year deal, 
not sure he'd exactly be willing to come back to Chicago again to be in the backup role behind Peter Morazic necessarily. But I don't think he'd be a terrible option. I just don't think it's the most likely. The guys who I do think are likely here, Blackhawks fans, Someone maybe like Casey DeSmith if the Pittsburgh Penguins don't bring him back. Alex Nedeljkovic is also a free agent goalie, but he's really been inconsistent since that stellar uh, little rookie season that he had with the Carolina Hurricanes. Was not very good in Detroit. Wasn't very good with the Pittsburgh Penguins or consistent, at least, with the Penguins this past season. Uh, Casey DeSmith, though, as a a veteran who's going to be 33 in August, won't cost a lot of money coming off a year in which he went 12-9-6 with a 2.89 goals against, 8.95 save percentage. I know those aren't great numbers, but he's put up better numbers in the couple of years prior, and he's not going to break the bank and could be someone willing to sign a one-year deal to be uh, the 1B option for the Chicago Blackhawks. I also think uh, James James Reimer could potentially be an option here. Uh, went 11, 8, and 2 with a 3, 3.11 goals against and a 904 save percentage and two shutouts and 25 starts this year. Turned 36 in March, so he's a veteran kind of at the end of his career. I don't think he'd be too opposed to being in that role for the Blackhawks. Anti Ranta, I think, is a little bit past his prime and put up an 872 save percentage with the Carolina Hurricanes. So I'd be pretty concerned with the numbers he'd put up with the Blackhawks defense in front of him. But Casey DeSmith, James Reimer, those kind of seem like likely options to me, Blackhawks fans. I wouldn't even hate Alex Nedeljkovic if it was on a cheap one-year deal. There is some upside there. It's just the lack of consistency that's a little concerning. Martin Jones is someone who's out there, but he's really struggled over the last handful of years. This past season with a 902 save percentage, was the first time he put up a save percentage above 906 years. So I'm kind of out on Martin Jones, but if the Blackhawks do pursue the free agent market, I think Casey DeSmith and James Reimer are two guys who make sense. I know they're not among the top goalies in this free agent class. It's not a very good free agent class for goalies regardless, but uh, I know they're not going to get a lot of luster, but I do think those are the likely options for the Blackhawks. Let me know your thoughts on uh, Casey to Smith, James Reimer, adding a veteran like that, I just think is the most likely scenario for the Blackhawks if they do hit the free agent market. And if one, uh, you know, maybe one of these guys sign on with the team and they try to pass him through waivers, and that's who the Blackhawks go and get. I think uh, it is an option for the Blackhawks. I think they're weighing their options heavily with what they're going to be doing with the backup goaltender position for next year. We'll see if they wind up hitting the free agent market, but those are some of the names that I think fit the mold of what the Blackhawks could trying to be adding if they do go that route with the backup next year. That's going to wrap up today's episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, everyone. As always, thank you all again for joining me on the show. Make sure to go and hit that like button, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel to help support the show. Uh, Also go and follow Lockdown Blackhawks for free wherever you may be listening to your podcast. Rate and review the podcast as well. That also always helps me out tremendously. You can find me on X at Jack Bushman too. Go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey so that way you can get all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. Until tomorrow's episode, everyone, Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you next time on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.